everybody, and thank you so much, all of you, for joining for Artful Design Television COVID-19 edition. As always, uh, find archive recordings, other things, links to our special guests material, all from artful.design slash television. I'm your host, Go Wong. I'm going to call out our co-organizer and co-producer, Kung Woo Kim. And today we have a special guest and our co-host, Perry R. Cook. Perry, how are you doing? I'm good. Thank you so much for joining us. And I just thought I'd give everyone just a brief introduction in, for, for Perry. For some, I think many people here know, know you or know of you. Uh, but for those that don't know Perry, I want to give you an introduction. And by the way, uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, uh, Artful, Design, dot, uh, Artful Design TV is a multi-format weekly series encompassing artful design, music coding, critical making with helpings of history and philosophy and life check-ins. No experience needed. All are welcome. And of course, this is an ongoing experiment. Now, my co-host, Perry Cook, who I think of as the Zen master of computer music. Readers of Artful Design may remember Perry from chapter five on interface design, as well as the interlude titled Dialogue with a Zen Master, which Perry is here situated in the studio, which I believe you're currently physically at at the moment, right, Perry? Yes. And, uh, so, as Perry's rubber chicken points out on the right side of the screen, at different times in his life, Perry has been a computer science professor at Princeton, a researcher at Stanford at Interval and Interval Research, a rock and roll sound man and amusement park audio guy, a conservatory trained vocalist and trombonist, an electrical engineer, has a PhD in, in EE, a world expert on the technology of the human voice, and the co-founder of online arts and creative technology education company, Cadenze. He also previously held paying jobs as dog catcher, picker of strawberries, country club nightman, watchman, breakfast cook, disco sound and lighting engineer, parks and recreation gardener, math and physics tutor, early music singer, and fashion show organist. Interesting guy, says the rubber chicken. And personally for me, you know, Perry, it, Perry was my PhD advisor, but remains my kind of life PhD advisor, even though uh, I graduated somehow from Princeton back in 2008. Here Perry is pictured, at least in my mind, telling me, go, whatever you do, do it with aesthetics. And which is something that I think Perry still claims that he doesn't remember saying to me. But for me, this is like, I feel like this is one of the very first things Perry ever said to me when I got to Princeton as a wide-eyed first year PhD student. Um, Perry was my advisor then. Nowadays he's more of a life Sherpa. And uh, I've had Perry uh, and, and Stacy have been very kind. They live up in the mountains of Southern Oregon. And they've had, in writing Artful Design, I actually visited Perry and Stacy on m multiple occasions. And they were kind enough to have me stay with them for, I think, a total of, of three weeks across three different trips, in which I interviewed Perry and documented much of his work and really his way of thinking about design and music and how all these things fit together. He has a studio which he's fashioned for himself uh, adjacent to their house. And in the studio, I'm just give you a view of that before we transition to Perry in his studio. It looks something like this, which for me, I feel like is kind of a, always feels like a, a kind of a inside out representation of Perry's mind as best as I can make it. We have a lot of wondrous things happening in there. It's both chaotic, but also has a strange order to it, which I feel like one can navigate with sufficient Zen. Um, and, and that is the Zen master in his studio. And with this, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, welcome Perry. How are you doing? I am good. <laughs> so, yeah, how is the weather up there in Oregon? Uh, the weather up here is glorious. It's... Uh, been cold in the morning and very warm in the afternoon. We're supposed to have 80 degrees tomorrow. So it's just pretty dreamy for being outside or inside. The moon was epic last night. And um, I have no problem with social distancing because I live 20 miles from any town or city. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, first of all, we're gonna do a little check-in together as we're doing with Perry. And I think this check-in is actually inspired by a project from um, 
some years ago uh, called We Feel Fine. This is back from 2008 by Jonathan Harris and Seth and Kemvar, and in which they actually scraped the internet blogs and other things for the phrase I feel or we feel. And they categorized kind of like made histograms and other kind of visualizations of how people are feeling in a word or in a phrase. So I thought maybe just to get us all just a little bit of a quick check in for everyone. How do you feel at this moment? And please, if you like, type the answer into chat. This is also our chance for everyone to make sure to familiarize ourselves with the chat interface. Um, so I'm going to start and yeah, I'm seeing thankful. I'm going to type stressed, <laughs> but thankful. Some people are bored, some people are good, some people are nostalgic, a bit anxious, great, exasperated, uh, excited, learning, uncertain. Yeah, I think this, these are, I think the, the feelings of the times, cramped but cheery. Thank you all very much. And there's Frank Hawk, I believe, from China or is he in, in California right now? Well, thank you everyone. Please continue to, he's, he's in California. So please feel free to, uh, uh, to continue sharing this as we go. Next order of business is, remember we had an optional homework assignment last week in which uh, everyone, if they wanted to, could write one or more COVID-19 haikus something about our circumstances, something about our life, something about the past, the future, something related to COVID-19. And so the way to submit this is a twofold, one of two ways. One, if you go to the archive page in Artful Design TV, if you go here, there's actually an optional homework submission portal. If you click that, I'll take you to the submission portal, just a Google form which you can write your haiku and optionally your name or if you prefer a pen name. And also uh, I believe Kung Wu is going to post the link to this submission portal in chat. So if you got one or more haikus, uh, please submit them. And we're gonna read some of them at the end of today's, uh, today's broadcast. So while this is happening, what we're going to do is to do our weekly uh, kind of group dance 30 seconds that was the other homework is to kind of practice your numa numa dance do it your way and so 30 seconds i think for those who are joining us the first time just move however you want in your own way but move to the music and uh, put yourself into it so for some dancing so here we go my Can you hear this? My 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 Right, I hope that gets you energized a little bit. And also, you know, it's just good to move together. And so with this, I'm gonna go back and to talking about kind of what we're, what we're gonna address today, which is code, music, and a bit of self-fashioning. And um, the first thing I'm gonna talk about actually is uh, something that Perry is, is, if you know Perry, you'll likely know many of the things he's worked on. Um, Everything from controllers to sound senses and physical models to the laptop orchestra. Uh, he's been with Smule from really day one. And also he's the co-founder of Cadenze and might know him for many other things. But if there's one artifact that we might associate with Perry's controller building, it might be his coffee mug. This is a coffee mug that makes music. It has sensors on it. It's embedded with sensors like accelerometers, as well as force sensing resistors. Um, and um, 
Let's see, if Perry's internet holds up, we can maybe get a live demo of this. Going over here. Ah, here great. we go. Can you see it? Oh, yes. Yes. It's 23. It's 23 years old. I crafted it 23 years ago. I was looking, I was sitting in the graphics lab at Princeton, and I was thinking, <clears throat> Bill for Plank, who I used to work with a lot at uh, Interval and at Stanford, um, was really into everyday objects that fit in the hand nicely. And I was looking around saying, what's in the world that fits in the hand nicely that I'm very comfortable with? And a coffee cup seemed to be the perfect thing because I spend much of my day with a coffee cup. And so um, it actually has this kind of self stabilizing mechanism if you put your thumb through it. And um, basically I just put some FSRs on it and a tilt sensor. And originally it was gonna be a shaker controller for my FISM models, but then I realized there's a microcontroller in here, so I might as well make it do interesting things as well. And so I just wrote some code for this basic stamp, which is a PIC chip with basic operating system. And uh, 23 years ago, I wrote this code and it still works today, which is a remarkable thing for any electronic thing that any of us build. And so basically this finger, is uh, drums. This finger is bass. There we go. Better? Okay. It's better. And then some voices. So the whole thing is. And um, in the area of towards the direction of instant gratification. The more you squeeze it, the more groovy it is. But the less you squeeze it, the more expression you can put into it. So basically this drummer, if you mash on him, is this drummer. But if you let up a little bit, it becomes kind of a Latin percussion Tito Puente soloist. And there are a bunch of other functions in here. Notably, it can also be a trumpet. So this is breath pressure. The overtone or the lip tension is tilt. And the three fingers are the valves. Pretty hard to play but that's the coffee mug. And it still works today, which is remarkable. It was dropped and broken and I had to glue it and tape it. It's, it's had some slings and arrows, but this is an eating club coffee mug from 1997, Princeton. Wow, check that out. Um, <laughs> any, uh, any questions actually on the coffee mug for people? Um, it, is, it is pretty hip. Um, Actually, let me see if I can, I'm gonna share my screen once more. And I have a, I have a video that I've taken of Perry playing this thing. Um, and by the way, before we play the video, I wanna, Perry actually in the NIME community, which is the conference and community for new interfaces for musical expression. It's a yearly conference. It's also a community of just music instrument and interface builders. Um, I think the most cited paper, perhaps by far, was actually Perry's 2001 uh, paper called Principles for Designing Computer Music Controllers, in which Perry actually articulated 10 principles that computer music controller designers might think about when they're designing things. Uh, I'll just read some of those. For example, instant music subtlety later. And uh, if there's one principle that is just embodied fully in the coffee mug, Perry, I think that one is very much, I think the coffee mug very much embodies that principle. Is that, is that kind of what you're thinking about when you had that principle? Yep, absolutely. Yep. And then, and, and, and frankly speaking, the piano. Everyone can play a piano. <laughs> because if you push the button down, it makes, it makes a sound. Interesting. Yeah, I remember you always saying that the piano has like the same exact interface for everyone. There's no power user mode. It's the exact same interface for the person for the complete novice as it is for 
the Virtuoso. And uh, it's something that you can instantly make sound with, but over time it has a ceiling for, and, and for nuance and subtlety. Um, just two more, which I think just something, things that we think about all the time, like programmability is a curse. What do you mean by that one, Perry? Uh, someone can get hung up tweaking code and never ship anything. Um, and also, if I had made the coffee mug in 1997 and every year went back and changed what every button did and what every function did, I would not be able to give a demo today because I would have to remember the last time I messed with it what it did. And so it is a programmable device. And there is one program in there. Basically, when you turn it on, depending on if you don't hold any buttons down, it runs one program. That's the drummer and the bass. If you hold the red button down, it's a trumpet. If you hold the black button down, it's a shaker. It just sends out continuous controller messages. The, if you hold both buttons down, that's whatever I programmed last year. And frankly, I don't remember what that is. And so um, programmability is a curse. Thank you, Perry. As our OS upgrades, as someone mentioned, and all the other things that make our code not work next month. And one more, smart instruments are often not smart. If the instrument's changing, learning from you, you might not be able to remember how to play it the next time. I mean, it seems like this has ramifications and for example, in how we might incorporate anything like machine learning or AI into instruments and or into so-called smart instruments. Is that right? Yeah, very cautiously. I very mean, cautiously. The, the history of humanity with objects is we learn to use them. We change we make a new one, we fashion it in a different way so it's more comfortable to use. But when we go back in a week, it hasn't changed. Right, again, the piano would be an example yeah, of exactly. an instrument that doesn't try to learn you in this dead. It doesn't change such that you can learn it. So, great, so food for thought. And uh, if you look for Perry Cook, Principles for Des uh, Designing Computer Music Controllers, you'll find the paper, it's not a long paper, it's like, and it's delightful to read. Uh, it's also just has Perry's, uh, you know, kind of a uh, panted, you know, uh, humor and and uh, for example copying an instrument is dumb that is about as academic as we can get here <laughs> leveraging expert technique is smart and there's just all kinds of wisdom that that is here so uh, i i took a video of perry uh last time i was in oregon and, <coughs> excuse me and i'm going to play it's about like a minute and 20 seconds and it's perry actually just rocking out on <laughs> Most of it's out of focus. Yeah, that's good. So there, there you go. Uh, any questions for, for Perry on, on this? This is embarrassing. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, imagine, imagine me kind of as like a first, uh, first year grad student at Princeton and having your advisor basically do that. Imagine how much like freedom and latitude you feel. Be like, you know what? If my advisor does this and like gets 
published for it and is like, you know, maybe I can do this too. And so um, maybe that's just, I think that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of, I think, my own personal gratitude to Perry as, a, as an advisor. Because, uh, you know, Perry, like whatever you meant by whatever you do, do with aesthetics. I've been trying to figure out what the hell that means ever since you said that and uh, or, or didn't say that. Any case, just a, just a note. Um, so uh, before we move on to the laptop orchestra, someone has asked, what were those diatonic rubber chickens hanging there? And, uh, and while you're seeing if we can get that set up, I believe you have this, this ready, right? So that's in the video. And I'm gonna have another photo here to give people a better look. Um, so remember from here, that's actually the rubber chickens, I believe that, that someone's talking about are those that's hanging on that rack uh, behind Perry here. Right, so I think Perry actually have these rigged to go, but only if his, his iPad works. Here's the chicken. All oh, right. to see there we go or if we turn it on in this position it's basically a chicken organ and you can change these notes if you hold down a button on this little box and move the chicken up and down it will sound continuous notes Let's see if I can get this to work or oh, that's good so, oh yeah, that's a great angle. And move the chicken. And let go of the button. That's the note that it sounds now. So. El pollo, el diablo. There we go. So there's some chickens. That is a creation most foul, if I may say so. The yeah, full name for this is called the, uh, p the, what is it called? Chocophonic foul harmonic, I believe is the name that you and Dan Levitin. I mean, I mean, it, I'm just gonna give a moment for everyone to let this sink in. Like this is the one of several joint creations from two of the greatest minds in our computer music field. Perry Cook and Dan Levitin, and they decided to make an instrument based on choking the chicken. So let that sink in. And again, uh, I've always thought about this as just something so playful, um, if, uh, if, if, if foul uh, in, in various ways. So thank you, Perry, for, for giving us that demo. While you have this, do you want to just show us briefly around your, your studio? Sure, now that I'm completely mobile. I can <laughs> Uh, so you've seen this side. This is the sort of synthesizer museum. This is a mini Moog, which inside has an autograph from Bog Moog. And uh, someone pointed out earlier my classic DX7, which partly paid for my dissertation at Stanford because of the royalties from Yamaha for the license for Karma. And this is a... Um, Korg Prophecy, which has tons of physical models in it. It's a monophonic flute, sax, synthesizer with wind control and stuff. And um, let's see. If we just look around, there are many speakers. There are many instruments. There are, yeah, I see Andy Leary right on. Uh, there's some brass. There's my euphonium. Euphonium was my first instrument of my childhood, aside from my voice. And so I'm a brass player from the beginning. And here's a collection of trombone, valve trombone, plastic trombone. Um, and as we walk around, there's just more studio. This is a purpose-built studio building that I designed and built uh, separate from my house. And it's the first time in history I ever had all of my weird instruments of my youth 
um, throughout my research career and everything all in one building, let alone even in one state because I had things stored in California and I had things in New Jersey and I had things at my mother's house in Kansas City, Missouri. And so um, there's lots of surround sound. There's a total of eight channels around, two high and two low in front, uh, two high and two low in the rear, center channels, uh, two above. So there's a speaker up there. And um, quite a few robot critters. So here's a tabla with a uh, set of fingers that I'm controlling this with a car remote control, which turns on a 12 volt battery. Um, seashells, which are a big part of my musical career as a brass player. So there's a seashell sitting on top of a spherical speaker, which resonates through it. Lots of spherical speakers and heads and other things around. Um, let's see, am I missing anything? Oh, and then there's the basic console and primary mix location and computer and uh, oh more robots there's a marimba back there that's turning into a robot remote controlled there's a um, old wooden box which has a sequencer in it which is supposed to be playing but it's not there we go those are solenoids just knocking on the inside of the box and Another case, which has actually a robot drummer in it, maybe, see if I can get that to work, stand by, we're almost done. Nope, I may have just blown it up. I already keep going, but uh, I just want to say from chat, it seems like there are people who, who are expressing approval for your life choices. There you go. Oh, yeah. So one of my former students and colleagues and collaborators, Ajay Kapoor, was always complaining that he had to take his robots apart and put them in cases in order to port them and ship them. So I said, why not just build a robot into the case and not have to pack it up? And so I have a number of these boxes that basically are completely self-contained robotic percussionists. And all of these guys speak OSC to each other as well. So they can all play in, uh, in tandem and in unison. So that's the quick studio tour. Thank you, Perry. And by the way, uh, I can tell you that is just kind of the, the first order tip of the iceberg in terms of things that are in Perry's studio. Um, you, you saw some of the musical noggin phonic kind of head models that are also speakers. Somewhere in there is also a uh, plastic lettuce that makes music. Uh, is Romaina Rocca still around, Perry? Is yeah, that... it's around here somewhere. But, I also have no idea how Perry finds anything that's not immediately visible on the surface, uh, but somehow he does. Um, oh, there's, there's uh, the Romain, Romain Araka. And, and a lot of uh, accordions and a shen that Go gave me. And tap shoe and maraca from Interval Research, circa 1998. Um, yeah. And it goes on and on. And an actual right. drum set. Wonderful. Right, um, <laughs> any questions from, from anyone? Any, uh, any comments? There's some, there's some good commentary going on here. Um, <laughs> and so actually, um, can you, pl so as you answer the question about the plastic lettuce, I'm going to, uh, get the next part ready.
How do you play the plastic lettuce? It is asked. The plastic lettuce has a Bluetooth connected transmitter in it that just transmits, transmits three accelerometer positions. It's an old Bluetooth radio from old, old SparkFun days. And so inside that, it's basically just a shaker. So it tells you what axis it is. It would take me probably an hour and two reboots to get it working again, um, connected to Bluetooth on this laptop. But it, in theory, it should still work, of course. Of course. Um, <laughs> here's an, another question about what you're working on, but maybe Perry, like I think we're about, we're gonna, I think I have a feeling we're gonna see exactly what you've been working on recently in just a moment. Um, so we're gonna post a note that question, but that is, I think we're definitely gonna get, get a glimpse of what Perry's working on. And it's very related to, it seems like to these times. Um, but I wanna show you one more thing. And uh, before we, we turn, we open things up and I'm gonna go back to slides. And it has to do with something else that Perry's been not only involved in, but Perry helped to start. Uh, in the very first place. And that is the laptop orchestra kind of as we know it, which is a group of people with laptops. But very critically, these laptop orchestra stations have hemispherical speaker arrays that keep sound local to the instrument. In many ways, Perry has been at the forefront of not only designing controllers to make music, but thinking about like in what ways do we actually relate to these instruments and the sounds that they make. For example, you know, by having sound local to the instrument gives us a sense of embodiment where we feel like the sound is actually coming from the physical object rather than say, if I plug in my laptop into a PA system and sounds coming from speakers around me, that's a very different uh, sense of presence um, that that particular sound or instrument is actually making. And this detail, while it may seem small, completely changes the way we think about designing instruments, what kind of music we might write for those instruments. So in many ways, the laptop orchestra is this concerted exploration of that. And it was something that was really begun in earnest by Perry and Dan Truman, uh, a music professor who, who actually is would be here if he's not teaching a three-hour Zoom class at Princeton right now. Um, but uh, uh, Dan and Perry started the Princeton Laptop Orchestra in 2005. And uh, we build our speakers out of different things. Uh, these are actually speakers from the Stanford Laptop Orchestra made out of Ikea salad bowls that we drilled holes into and put car speaker drivers into. And this was started in, in 2008 after I came to Stanford from Princeton and really kind of took this idea and kind of made the left coast, west coast sibling of Plork and that is of course Slork. Now, um, to give you a sense of actually the very, one of the very first pieces that, uh, that we've ever done for Laptop Orchestra. This is actually the first piece that Perry and I actually written first, the first piece that we've written for, for Plork for the very first concert for Laptop Orchestra. Is that, is that right, Perry? Am I remembering that correctly? That is correct. The first one we did, yes. So I'm going to just play a little bit of this. I'm not going to play the entire thing, but I'm going to go through and give you a sense of what this looks like and sounds like and hopefully give you a sense of what it feels like. And maybe Perry and I can narrate parts of this as a, and Perry is the conductor in this case, and in front of him is a inkjet printer. This is a kind of a time on way of saying, I, my station's ready to go. It's a thumbs up, especially for pieces that are networked, which this one is. Those read medium sparse, and the other one reads 
can read, read the other one. But basically the printouts. Actually, Perry, would you like to say a few things about what you're holding up? Yeah, so basically it's an 8x4 step sequencer, which is clocked globally from Go's conductor computer. And so it's actually sending every tick what row and what column is active. And so that way if anything's dropped, no one's off by any number of beats or anything. It's not it's not advances, it's absolute locations. And so row three beat two is sent to all computers and then again statistically just like the coffee mug there's a table in there that says how likely it is that something should be played if they have their button down and so if they have their button down and the roll of the dice works out right then a sound is selected based on the color that they programmed in there and so they've got a row of colors across the bottom and they can say pink this button blue this button and that way the programming of the piece goes forward and that's what I'm holding up um, on the other sheet is basically a grid with some of those colors on it and that's being printed out I made up a whole bunch of those prior to the concert and then randomized the pages and had them sent out through the printer and so I just hold up whatever's coming out and that's how the piece advances thank you and I think the, the range from dense to wicked sparse I remember Yes, yeah. And that can change depending on how many players you have. So if you have 45 laptop orchestra players, dense can mean really dense. Great. Um, so if we go back to my slides here, I think there's some, some questions here. Uh, I, we titled this Coding, Music, and Self-Fashioning. And I think there's a something that I as a computer science undergrad and I was also known as a computer science PhD working under Perry and Perry you are educated really like ostensibly as an electrical engineer but also a conservatory trained musician and then your PhD from Stanford was an EE but, but you are also you know part of karma right so in many ways we're we we come from on paper we look like engineers but we also do music as many people do uh, that are joining us on, on, this, on this broadcast. And I guess the critical question here is uh, like, you know, kind of what makes a good engineer? What makes a good designer? And, and you know, what does music and art have to do with it? And I know you haven't been almost really a lifelong educator among many other things and in your efforts with Cadenze, like what, what would you say to that? Oh man. Um, it's a big question. Yes. I think someone with domain knowledge or curiosity who's willing to really do the work and speak the language of the people that they're working with and for. Um, and so for me, you know, I went to conservatory first. And so I was always a educated musician and then went to engineering school later when I realized I didn't really know enough math or acoustics or uh, to, to do what I wanted to do technically. And so, um, you know, people don't have to go to art school and computer science major, but uh, I find so many who do, who do so well. Um, we've seen examples of mer mergers where two people from very different domains work really well together because they can show each other the inside of their mind or their discipline. Um, and so the famous uh, Bell Labs visitors program, you know, people ranging from Laurie Anderson to um, Jean-Claude Brisset and Dexter Morrill and all sorts of people visited Bell Labs and worked with Max and John Pierce. And Max is a perfect example. Max, I don't think had music classes, but he's probably one of the most important musical figures of, you know, both millennia. <laughs> and so um, he, he, he was curious and interested in music and art and invited people in to work um, on that with him and teach him about it. 
and uh, change his mind about things. And so um, either domain knowledge or an openness to learn about it, and I think is, is one of the most important things for a designer engineer, especially in the arts, but in any area, you know, biology. <laughs> so on that note, I'm gonna sh just share this, these three slides, right? In higher education, we talk about educating the I-shaped student, which in fact, we said we shouldn't educate only I-shaped students, which is a student who has really just depth. And then they're like, you know, maybe we should have like T-shaped students. You know, we have some depth and also the horizontal bar, it's kind of breadth. In artful design, there's this notion of pie-shaped student, which I think much more associated closely to what Perry is, is talking about. In fact, I think Perry has m shaped fundamentally my notion of what a pie-shaped person could be. One hand, there is, there is disciplinary expertise. For example, computer science or EE. That's your craft, your toolbox. But then this is, I think, the domain that Perry was talking about, the domain expertise, which could be music or public health, something with which to, to which you apply your disciplinary expertise. But then, uh, for me, there's also this thing which I learned from Perry. And uh, it's, you know, what I call the aesthetic lens, the philosophical, artistic, moral lens that gives broader meaning and context in bridging these two legs. And in a way, I think the, the top bar is really the tacit dimension, the, the thing that you can't really put on a transcript thing, you can't really, you know, nail down completely or quantitative, entirely quantitatively. It's something that you've got to, it's, a, it's an issue of quality. In, in how we think about, you know, how these things, these combine. And, and uh, so it's a, it's a real honor for me to have Perry co-hosting today's show, because I think in a way, I think Perry taught me to be, to strive to be always a, a pie-shaped person. So uh, with, with this, this is kind of, the entire show has been kind of, today has been a segment of, you know, how do we think about things? And, uh, and things to think about. But with this, maybe we might transition back to Perry, back to the question of what, what are you working on now, Perry? Um, and what sort of things? I wonder if you can give us a, a demo. Uh, cleaning my studio for the last couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> you might not be able to tell, but uh, it's better than it was. Um, just, uh, I sort of follow my my tail or my my nose on on interest of the day i'm always programming something i'm always building something i'm that I don't solder and write some code every couple of days i i start to get weird so i'm either fixing things because there's things constantly broken or i'm building something new i'm working on a new robot um, which will actually use this little um, hand pan. And um, this one will actually have four notes, which is A, G, C, and E, which is replaces T, which are the proteins in an RNA sequence. And so it'll be a little uh, genome sonifier that basically plays the notes in reading the genome. And I um, downloaded the Wuhan Seafood Market genome and um, made a little program that, uh, let's see if I can get it to work. Let me share my screen. Uh, here we go. Um, Corona music. Yes, Corona music. So I've got a little uh, processing sketch here that's listening for OSC from uh, this Chuck program, which is reading the genome sequence, which actually looks like this. Uh, Wuhan seafood market pneumonia virus. There's the sequence that it's reading. That's what gets published for geneticists to look at and try to make um, vaccines or agents that will get rid of it or match it with others and figure out how it's mutating. Um, so it's possible this will work. There we go. 
you're seeing the the, the display. Mm -hmm. um, I know what happens. I have to explicitly, it's Chuck, I have to explicitly send it to the DAC, which is the Zoom conference. Anyway, if you heard that, it would be playing little samples of this guy. But in the future, it will actually be whacking these individual notes on this little hand drum, tongue drum. And so it'll just sonify it. And then there are particular proteins within there that they figured out what they do. It's the thing that gets in your cell and makes bubbles, which has more of itself in it. And so I'm going to look for those matches as well, and I'm going to have that sonified via some of these percussion instruments which are hanging around here, like the cowbell. And so in that case, we don't want more cowbell. <laughs> but uh, it will tell us when we've gotten to that place. Uh, another thing I'm working on, which I'm sure will not work, is basically a drum sequencer. Um, which I've always kind of been interested in why sequencers always look like, you know, four rows of eight or two rows of 16. And so I made a sequencer which is actually circular and it's kind of a gene sequencer, which is a pun, but it's actually not. And I'm really interested with all the really beautiful corona art we've seen, all the different renderings of the coronavirus and its spikes. And so I stole as many of those as I could and made a huge directory. Um, let's see. Another CV. So this is the CV19 coronavirus sequencer. And here's all the images. So, um, so I dug through all these images and normalized them in size and played with the backgrounds and made them all kind of look nice, which was just my knitting exercise, which I think you're going to talk about later. Just the craft of putting something together like this. And so the sequencer actually looks like this. All right, so that's me coughing. And this is me coughing. It's a circle synthesizer. Pause it for a second. So this is just sonifying these these recordings of me, but also showing the drum pattern is a four bit pattern, and so it selects an image to show on the right side based on where it is. There we go, and uh, arbitrary number of beats, and uh, then there's a mutate button which causes it to just self modify and fill itself in with all sorts of evilness. And then we can end it uh, hitting the exit button. It seems like Perry may have crashed Zoom. So I hope that gives you an idea. What we didn't see here is actually how this program quit itself. It actually melts and the window turns into a single pixel. And uh, for what philosophical or, or metaphorical uh, thing is happening there, we'll leave that to our, to our uh, imaginations. So, um, Hopefully Perry can can come back for as we as we end this and the time check it is six minutes after the hour, I'm and back. I think hi Perry are you back you're back. Um, we saw everything except the melting of your, uh, but maybe this is this is something that you can. All this talk of code and by the way Perry was using the Chuck programming language which is actually another one of these things that Perry helped to create. This is actually something that Perry and I originated back in Princeton. I'm gonna bring up screen sharing for one more time. And that is Chuck. All this talk of, uh, all this talk of, a, uh, of, of coding has got me to really wanna write some code and write some code together. So we started that looking into Chuck today in terms of what Perry has done. So I think in, 
perhaps as early as next week. I already have been working on kind of a group coding, collaborative coding thing. I hope it works, but you know, hey, what could go wrong? But Chuck is uh, open source, freely available. I always like to say it crashes equally well on Linux, Windows, and OS 10, even though that's strictly speaking probably not true. But check out Chuck. And also Perry's been using Maui, which is the mini Autical user interface, which is basically kind of Chuck's own GUI building system and allows you to abuse and use things in, in glorious ways. So uh, with that, uh, what we're gonna do is actually just wrap up, but also we'll hang out a little bit, if, if, especially if Perry has time for those of you who would like to hang out a bit and ask for their questions. I do wanna read a few more, a few, which is two responses uh, from COVID-19. Look out the window with homeschool and work from home, the mind wanders off. Staying now at home, productivity is dead, regrets yet to come, April 1st, 2020. Grab an old t-shirt, turn it into a face mask, let it flatten the curve. So we're gonna try to find a way to post those online. Thank you so much for doing this last week's optional homework. Please feel free to do this. This week's homework, and there's Perry's haiku. Right, looking on the bright side of, of life. I like that. Um, and maybe related to what actually what Perry's haiku is saying, your optional homework assignment for this week is to work on a craft, any craft, anything you would consider craft. This includes bread baking, even though yeast seems to be less and less, uh, seem to be more and more rare. But for me, this has actually been building a virtual city in SimCity 3000. Remember that game from like 20 some years ago? I've been kind of making my own, albeit fantastical, digital civil society, perhaps in contrast to how I feel about the world and societies today. Um, but that's been my craft. It's kind of just crafting this. Uh, it could be embroidering, it could be cooking, it could be coding. If you want to try to download Chuck and write a program. So it's a craft, anything that you would consider a craft, and you do it because you're interested, and you do it for its own sake, and you can, and the way to submit this We've actually made a submission portal in the same place that the previous submission portal is in. And if I can find this, this is in the Artful Design Television uh, archive page. Optional homework submission, a craft, any craft off of episode two. And here, all you got to do is just the same way you submitted the haikus, your email, tell us briefly what you've been working on, and optionally add uh, a photo, a drawing, an audio snippet, or PDF of your craft. And we'll share some of these at, at the next broadcast in a week. And uh, with this, I think we're going to uh, sign off. Uh, Perry, anything else to to say for for everyone here? Thank you all for coming. And I think we should dance again. I think so too. So we are going to. I'm going to share my screen one more time. So, as always, thanks to everyone before we dance. Uh, thanks to Kung Wu. Thanks to all of you for joining. Thanks to Perry for joining us as our special guest and co-host. Please come back and, and do this again. Um, and there's so much that I would love for people to see what you're working on. And as always, uh, join us weekly next week, next Wednesday, at 1 p.m. California time. And uh, you can always tune in from artful.design slash TV. That's also where the archive is. And with this, are you all ready? Back to our 30-second group dance. New Manuma seems great. We're also looking for other materials. So if you have suggestions, let us know. But for a second week, we're going to let him guide us. So here we go. I'm going to open the video. And... I'm going to bring back my Zoom window, check it into gallery view. Here we are. All right, y'all. My 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 my
Thank you all very much for joining. Have a wonderful day. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay artful. See y'all next week.